room was shot over 10 weeks in Toronto. Um, half of that period was in Pinewood Studios in Toronto, and the, the second half was on location in various places out in the suburbs. Everything was shot two cameras. The reason for that was, you know, two reasons. The, the director only got a limited amount of time with Jacob Tremblay, the child actor, because obviously with a child you can only shoot a certain amount of hours per day. And the second thing was he didn't want to miss anything that Jacob was doing at any time in any scene because, you know, based on that reduced timeline and also a child actor as brilliant as Jacob Tremblay will still provide you with different things at different times and it's about just capturing all those moments. So yeah, like on Media Composer we used multi-camera all the time. We're always aware of there being another option on every shot that we used. Um, and we cut on set uh, for, for the entire period as well and then brought it back home to Dublin and cut there as well. Being shot in one single space, the things I thought initially that were gonna provide you know, obstacles for me in terms of how do we show passage of time, how do we, you know, we can't ever step outside just to show, show an establisher to say like a day has passed, two days have passed. Actually, they kind of became redundant because as soon as we started to see the film come together and a lot of the first half of the film was shot consecutively to kind of give Jacob a sense of how the film, how the story was playing. Uh, once we saw that, we just realized, look, story is driving you through always. And, you know, just try and remove anything that is getting in the way of this naturally, brilliantly written, brilliantly directed, tense storyline. The first cut of the film was still uh, about three and a half hours long uh, and the finished film was about an hour 50 so we lost a lot from the second half of the film in particular. We watched the three and a half hours and we knew the story was working and everything was working and, and then you just have to be a bit brave and go well obviously you can't be three and a half hours long so we kind of have to feel that we're making good decisions throughout. Room is a very emotional film so you don't want anything to ever get in the way of how those careful beats play. Once you make the first cut into that three and a half hour assembly, you actually feel propelled to keep cutting, to keep tightening and keep making it of kind of what it should be, you know, film shaped thing. I know Lenny was very insistent on shooting. He didn't want to cut scenes once he was shooting. He wanted to go and shoot them even if he knew himself, you know, he might shoot a four minute scene and say, he might think, you know what, we might only have 20 seconds that we want to use from this, but I, you know, I really want to shoot the entire shooting script of this film whilst tweaking along the way with Emma, the writer. In a small part, being able to give him the flexibility to see versions very quickly on set was a great, great tool to have for us. And then in the second phase of the edit of the film, we were very lucky to have a sound team working parallel with us quite early on. So we'd throw things back and forth and uh, we'd always have really good temp screening mixes done on Pro Tools. Uh, so there was a great kind of collaborative process with the sound team of Steve Fanning and Niall Brady uh, at the same time. What was great about shooting in room was we could go back uh, based on a scene that I may have done a rough cut of, just pick up some things like the opening of the film uh, there was a first version done of that and then over several nights when Jacob maybe was finished and the crew were still there Lenny would shoot extra details of the room and just make sure we had all that material which we ended up using like all of in some fashion. I think he found it useful that I was there, I was on the same time zone as him and you know um, that we were able to kind of have a constant back and forth and a constant reworking and reimagining of the film. In a film like Room the, the pacing was you know, often dictated either by very careful decisions that they made in translating the book to screen. And then again on set, how Lenny would react to how certain things were playing and make these really, really great changes just throughout. And then, you know, quite often, if things felt similar in room, which they rarely did, I mean, the coverage was amazing how they'd kind of, you know, when you're confined in a space, little details in room started to become alive in a way that you wouldn't have in the film where, you know, it's set in a desert or, you know, by the sea that has these grand vistas. All of a sudden your mind starts to work differently because you start to notice these things in the background, like details in the walls start to become almost like characters. The pacing was quite easy to, to hone in on because it was all about, you know, you've got a setup where there's a 
the first 10 to 15 minutes or so is, is what is a day like in room? And um, you know, we cut shorter versions of that, but we felt we landed on, a, on a, a certain rhythm of what a day was like from beginning to end, that people, once people knew what that was, then, then you know, the rest of the story becomes uh, essentially a escape story, like how do we get out of here? And, uh, and once you start that, you, you know, your pace is dictated by, by, by the things that happen or that get in the way of their escape. So it's about playing little things for attention, but it was incredible with a story as strong as that. Quite often we found we didn't have to create extra beats for tension, just things presented themselves and if we felt they, they felt real, we might add seconds here or there, but we rarely tried to kind of just create air where there wasn't any. It was all about trying what and what happens next and what happens next. It's one of those films where, you know, if you move two scenes forward, if you're actually just in a timeline, just jump two scenes back, you go, God, I can't believe a lot has happened in that space, short period of time, you know? I use the timeline in a, in a kind of a messy fashion, to be honest with you, because I like to keep stuff, material alive in the timeline, even if I've muted it, or I've got different shots covering other shots that aren't actually visible. But I find, you know, Media Composer has always been, the timeline feature has always been brilliant in that regard. And you can just stack stuff and kind of play with material in different ways. I mean, Script Sync was a brilliant tool um, that I still use in an older version of Media Composer as well, um, as was Phrase Find. I suppose I'm loyal to the software going back, you know, since like 1998, you know. Uh, but I feel that, you know, to be fair to Media Composer, it's adapted as the years have gone by. And it's still fundamentally about a tool for storytelling. There's other tools you can use there in terms of sound mixing, colour correction, so on, that are very useful, keying, uh, all these things. But ultimately, it doesn't get in the way of just trying to sto tell stories. Uh, whereas maybe other pieces of software have kind of, you know, made jumps down certain directions. Avid has always been, you know, about editing first and foremost. And that's something I've certainly appreciated over time. Like quite often these days we were, we're as editors, we're required to just find ways to shorten scenes and kind of change the timing of a scene. And if it's a locked off shot, or even if it's not a locked off shot, sometimes things like Animat, the Kier, are, uh, it's really great to kind of create garbage mats and change the timings of shots uh, internally and so on. So I kind of, I find myself using everything and then down to the audio side, even just from a temp mix point of view, just would use everything in terms of graphing and volume graphing and audio mixing, all those kinds of features. Sometimes the hardest thing, as I say, to, to be exposed to is, is when a film just comes down and down and down and when hard decisions are made about story. That is the challenge of film versus television, is film does have to resolve itself, however shockingly or however experimental you are in, your, in the process, you do have to kind of round it up, you know what I mean? You have to make bold decisions, particularly in the last third of a film. Quite often an audience is getting, you know, lethargic or whatever, you know, they, there's only so, much, so long they can hold on to that, to the storytelling, and, and that's where, where often you make, gotta make those hard decisions. What I would recommend to anyone who's interested in getting into editing is often don't forget to watch stories, you know. And that includes read books and watch other films and watch, you know, great TV shows, watch music videos. Always think about storytelling because you can learn technology really well and you can learn how to put a scene together quite quickly. But the hardest thing to learn is about kind of the arcs, you know, and telling stories for a long period of time, keeping an audience's attention and, you know, merging scenes and changing the orders of scenes and putting things in different places. It's incredibly pleasurable. It's an exciting thing to do, but it's, uh, you know, uh, the only way you can get in that position is by surrounding yourself with stories and thinking about how they might translate to the project you're working on at that time.